last Sunday, I had the great blessing of working with our upper elementary fellowship. I think I got a better name for them. Our third, fourth, and fifth graders. And they started the day. They knew they were baking cookies, so their mind was on the stuff that was going in the oven. We had cookies and candies, and they were looking at those. They wanted to sample the candy before it went into the cookies. I'm surprised we had any candy for the cookies. And my apologies to the parents of our third, fourth, and fifth graders because I gave them each a cup of frosting that they immediately ate. I was like, don't you need to put that on your cookie? But they were eating it with spoons, getting a little crazier by the moment. But um, before they did that, I gave them the assignment to draw God. Imagine if I said that to you all, get a your bullet and then draw God. What would you think you'd put on your painting, your picture that you drew? What would you do? I said, don't look at anybody else's page. And they said they're going, leaning over looking, seeing what everybody else did. What do you think you'd draw if I asked you to draw God? Yes. A circle. That's interesting. Why would you draw a circle? Embraces all. Amen to that. Never ending. Like a, that's why rings are made in circles to, to signify the covenant that there's no beginning and no end in a circle. It's a good idea. Now Clark was the first to write anything on his page. He wrote I D K. I don't know. I said, well, that's that's a good good way to think of it, but no, you got to draw something. Then he looked at Miss Megan Gillespie's page, and she had a lot of yellow, just yellow, 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 yellow. It was getting bigger, bigger, bigger. It was light. Then I looked at um, Sarah Monto's page, and she had drawn Jesus. It was a man in brown with a brown beard. It was Jesus. And then Clark started drawing sort of a combination of the two. There was, there was a little body in the middle, but there was a lot of light coming out talked about what God looks like. God is male or female. Now, if you go to Sight and Sound, they're going to tell you God's a man, right? Anybody been to the Christmas show at Sight and Sound? I took my Baptist husband there once. That was a big mistake. On a busload of Methodists. First thing that happened to us was the usher said, get out here to me. Get out here now. I was like, excuse me? She said, get out here. You're in the wrong seats. We had to shift over one seat. She said, you're in somebody else's seat. I don't know who you think you are. And she chewed me out. I said, I'm sorry. I'll move him right now. We moved everybody over a seat. My husband's getting grumpier by the moment with that one. But then there is a scene over the stable where Jesus is being born, where a devil flies in, flies in literally, and has a sword fight with an angel. My husband says out loud, I want chapter and verse on that. I want to say, shh, 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 shh. Then the, the midwife in the scene says, oh, no, the mother's in trouble, and everyone gasps. Oh, I want to say, it comes out okay. He grows up. It's Jesus. Don't worry. But um, then at the end of this, the whole evening, the stable collapses and a cross comes up out of the floor, a huge cross, and at the top there's this God with a beard, white hair. It's a man, long white hair and a light beard, and that was God. My husband at that time said, I just think I want to go. I was like, please stop. Please don't do this. He said, that is not in Scripture. I said, I know it's not in Scripture, but just behave. Then they said, if you're not safe, you can be safe this afternoon. Just see your usher because your usher is safe. He said, my usher's not saved. She yelled at my wife. It was, it was an interesting day there. But how many of you would draw a guy with a beard, a long white beard? Maybe John could pose for him. Because that's what God is. If you go to the Sistine Chapel, God's got a long white beard touching Adam, right? I think the kids got it right. I think they saw light. And then I read some passages to them about in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. And I read about God created man in his own image. It's really a dom, which means human. Male and female, he created them. So we talked about it's God, male or female, and they, they didn't seem to know that one. But here we are. It's Trinity Sunday, and everybody's equally confused by the Trinity, aren't we? As we are by the image of God that we would draw on a page. Now, the next part was easy. They got to make cookies that look like themselves. I don't know if they did, because I had to leave before they got the hair on them. If they ever got any hair on, I don't know, because that was the frosting, and they had eaten it all by then. So maybe they were all bald. I was a part of a group back in the 80s called Christians for the Liberation of the Deaf Community because I served in deaf ministry. They came out with a Claggett statement that said, God is deaf. What do you think about that? Do you think God is deaf? Anybody here think God would be deaf? How would deaf people write that? Remember the movie Children of a Lesser God that came from the play of the same name because 
deaf people have been told forever that they were not created in the image of God. I literally had patients at St. Elizabeth's Hospital when I was the chaplain there to the deaf population who said they were told when they were kids, God, you can't go to church. Church is for hearing people, not for deaf people. God is for hearing people, not deaf. So, along the way, someone said, let's come up with a doctrine called the Trinity. That'll confuse people even more, right? We'll say that we have three people who are one person who is God. I think I told you all recently about my time in Japan when I visited my friend's English class. He taught college-level English. And he said, this is my friend Terry, who is a metojistu bokushi. I was like, what's a metojistu bokushi? Japanese people cannot say TH like we can. They just have no sound in their vocabulary for that. So it's metojistu is Methodist, bokushi is priest. So my friend, the Methodist priest, and he said to them, tell her about your lives. What religion were you when you were born? They all said Shinto. Shinto is the official religion of Japan, sort of. It means the way of many gods, which means that you can have all the gods you want. There was a god of beer. And what I found very interesting is because when you go to a brewery, there were kegs outside, and there was this guy carved sitting on top of the kegs. I said, who is it? They said, oh, that's the god of beer. He guards the, he guards the beer. It made sense to them. I forget his name, but he was the god of beer. They wanted to be Shinto when they were born because Shinto has beautiful ceremonies for the birth of a child. They all wanted to be Shinto then. And he said, how do you want to be married when you get married? They all said, Christian, Christian. And I was like, why Christian? Because Christians are the only people in Japan who have any exchange of vows in a marriage. So they promise to love one another and care for one another because no other, they're just married by a priest, either a Buddhist priest or a Shinto priest. And he said, how do you want to be buried? And they all said, Buddhist, because that's the big, flaming, great festival. And if you ever get to go to a Buddhist funeral, go, because it's amazing. But there are people, Muslims, think that Christians are polytheistic, because they say we have three gods. We don't have one god, we have three, because the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity was not concocted to confuse people. It was trying to give us a better way to understand how God works in our lives, the three distinct ways. We have God who's the creator, God the father, who is also the mother. Now, God is referred to as he a lot in scripture, but God also has some feminine passages as well. Later in Isaiah, I think it's chapter 56, or no, it's 63, it says, as one whom a mother comforts, so shall I comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. I am the Lord your God. As one whom a mother comforts, so shall I comfort you. And Jesus even said, Oh, I long to be a mother hen who gathers her chicks under her wing. There are feminine images of God as well. The Old Testament word for spirit or breath is ruach, which means it's a female form. Some people will say the father is the he, the son is he, and the Holy Spirit is she. I don't go that far, but it's hard to understand the fullness of God, isn't it? We have these three passages. First, it's when we read the Theophany to Isaiah. God is bigger than life there. God is on a throne. God's hem fills up the entire temple. Now, you got to remember the Temple of Jerusalem was a big building in its day. Huge. The only thing that was bigger was Solomon when he built his own palace down the road from it. I was not happy with that either. But God's hem fills the temple. That is how huge God is. And God says, whom shall I send and who shall go for us? Some people think that us as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the Trinity. Some people think it was the whole heavenly council, the cherubim, the seraphim, the angels, everyone gathered around God. God says, who shall go for us? And Isaiah says, here I am, send me. His lips have been touched with that coal and he's been cleansed. And we have that passage from Romans. Not the clearest of the Romans passages we've read the last couple of weeks, but this one talks about being adopted as children. We cry, Abba, Father, the very Spirit, bearing witness with our spirit, that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Because we'll suffer like him, we'll be glorified like him, because Jesus didn't become Christ. Christ became Jesus when he was born and lived among us. That's where we see God most clearly, isn't it? We have a passage about Nicodemus. You heard this story before, right? How many of you, when I said, say, here I am, send me, said it? I saw some lips moving out there. How many of you said, John 3.16, when it was read aloud. Y'all know that one, right? Let's say that together. For God so loved the world, that he gave us only... Do 
all know that one well, don't you? Now, Nicodemus is an interesting character. He's a Pharisee, but he's a different kind of Pharisee because usually Pharisees are the guys with the black hats. Everybody goes boo hiss when they come on the scene. They really thought they were doing God's will. They knew the law better than anybody. They really thought they were seeking after God, and they missed that Jesus was God's son in our understanding. But Nicodemus goes to him at night. Why do you think he goes at night? He doesn't want to be seen. Because he's going and he says to Jesus, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these things apart from God. He's saying, I know who you are, sort of, but I need some questions answered. Now this really is, you can't read John 3 without reading John 4, because John 4 is the Samaritan woman at the well who goes to Jesus in the middle of the day in bright light. The supposed enemy of the Jewish people and says, you're the son of the living God. That's what she says when she runs against her friends. Say, Come see a man who told me everything that I've ever done. Could he be the Messiah? She gets it. She offers her living water to drink. That's in the brightest of the day. And Nicodemus goes under the darkness of night. And he says to him, you've got to be born from above. You have to be born again. No one can see the kingdom without being born from above. And Nicodemus says, how is that supposed to happen? Can a grown man, an old man, enter a second time into his mother's womb? Because he's very literal in his understanding of what it means to be born again. How many of you are afraid to be born again because you don't want to be mistaken for one of those Pentecostal crazy people, those holy roller people? How many of you think that's what born again means? Or afraid that might be what it means? How many of you are born again? Raise your hand if you've been born again in Christ. I've got a couple of hands, though. just a couple. I hope to see every hand up out here because to be born again is not to go crazy at a holy roller meeting. Reminds me of my husband. We went to the crusades in Martinsburg. They had a crusade, a 10 crusade. They had everybody from the Roman Catholic priests in town through to the Pentecostal people. Baptists were sort of here. The Methodists are right in the middle because we can roll with anybody. You know, we, we don't judge anybody. If you want to praise God with your hands, your feet, if you want to dance, that's fine with us. If you want to praise God with your hands folded and in prayer, we'll roll with that too. But... There was a lady who was so taken with the choir singing, she had started to dance with a flag because she was waving and dancing. Everybody was smiling. I looked at my husband, who was sitting there growling. Oh, I said, what's wrong? He said, she didn't dance in church. He was a Baptist. You don't dance in church if you're a Baptist. My goodness gracious me, oh my, you do not dance if you're a Baptist. You all know that, right? But to be born again is to realize that God loves you enough to send his son into the world to be your savior. God's love for you is so great that God would take these tongs and have a seraph fly and touch your lips and forgive you of your sin then and then forgive you of your sin once and for all in his son, who is part of God himself. Because John, who wrote the story about Nicodemus, also begins his gospel with what? In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. And the spirit of God is the spirit of Christ, and it's all one. We only break it into three parts so we can understand better how God relates to us and how we relate to God. But there is only one God, and that is made clearest to us in Jesus Christ. Made clearest to us in his commandment that we love one another. It's not optional to love, is it? It's just not optional to love. We act like it is, but it's not optional to love. We will take prohibitions against something in Scripture and use it against other people, but comes loving everybody. We think that's a little too much for God to ask sometimes, don't we? Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. That's a hard one to do, isn't it? Especially in a climate like ours where politics have divided us so deeply. There's a wedge that's so great between people. We're called to love. I wish that people who memorize John 3.16 would memorize 17 as well. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, so that the world might be saved through him. Through him. The world might be saved, not just people like me, not people who vote for, I vote for, not people who say the words that I need to hear, not people who use my creed or my hymns, but that the world might be saved through him. God did not send the Son of the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Say that with me. For God did not send the Son into the world. Say it. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world that the world might be saved through him. We have a Savior in Jesus Christ. You have a Savior. You know the Savior. You know the story. Without the special effects, 
whether you think God is male or female, whether you think God is this or that, whether you see God as your parent, your loving parent, or it's the Christ who walks beside you, and the Spirit who fills you and uses you, know that God's love for you is what is what saves the world. Share that love with someone else, because there are too many people in the world that don't know how to be loved, because they've never been loved. It's been hard the last couple of weeks, because I live by myself, and Every doctor and nurse on the planet seems to ask me, do you live by yourself? You can't live by yourself, but I do. And it's hard to live by yourself. I told people the story of Sarah, the crazy lady who was my CNA in the hospital, my certified nursing assistant in the nursing home. She said to me one day, why isn't your husband here with you? I said, he died. Next day she said, I forget, why isn't your husband here? I said, he's still dead. And she said, what about your children? I don't have children. And she said, why don't you have children? I said, I couldn't. I tried. I can't have kids. I'm sorry. And I thought, why am I apologizing to you that I can't have children? Very strange. But it's hard when you're alone to realize that you're sick and you're not going to get better. You're just going to get older and a little bit worse with time. But I'm not going to be afraid of this. I'm going to trust Christ to get me through this. The Spirit's going to use me. I'm not done yet. I might not be preaching every Sunday. I might not be here every Sunday, but I'm going to be sharing Christ in some way with someone I know who needs God's love. Because the world is such a lonely place for so many people. We're going to share God's love. So if God says to you, who can I send? Who's going to go for us? What are you going to say? Say like you mean it. Come on now. Here I am. Send me. Here I am. Send me. Here I am. Send me. I said that to God when I got up those years ago and went forward at that service when Bishop Fredward said, God calls from the congregation, from the laity, men and women. First time anybody said that to me, and women, to be pastors in God's church. He was being called, and I was up and I was running before I knew I was standing up. And I've never regretted it one moment. Maybe a couple moments. No, no, no. I've never regretted it for a moment, honestly. God's going to use me somehow, some way, in my retirement and in my current condition and whatever condition there is to come. But those of you who have two good feet and two good legs and hands that don't shake and a voice that works all the time, tell somebody, do something for somebody. Bring in some toilet paper for somebody. That shows God's love. Bring in a can of meat or any more beef stew. Show somebody God's love in a real way. And tell people that God does not send his son in the world to condemn, to judge. Oh, we judge each other so harshly sometimes. But God sent his son in the world to save the world. You've got the son in your heart and through your spirit. Let it out. Amen? Amen.